Good evening. Welcome to this service of shadows. We've come tonight to observe a death. This is a different service than we ordinarily experience. This isn't a service filled with celebration and joy, although it is the reason that we have hope. We've come to observe the death of the light of the world. The story we'll tell tonight took place 2,000 years ago in first century Palestine, but it began before time itself was measured. The voice was speaking. The voice was and is God. This celestial word remained ever present with the Creator. His speech shaped the entire cosmos. Immersed in the practice of creating, all things that exist were birthed in Him. His breath filled all things with a living, breathing light. A light that thrives in the depths of darkness, blazes through murky bottoms. It cannot and will not be quenched. The true light who shines upon the heart of everyone was coming into the cosmos. He entered our world, a world he made, yet the world did not recognize him. Even though he came to his own people, they refused to listen and receive him. For God expressed his love for the world in this way. He gave his only son so that whoever believes in him will not face everlasting destruction, but will have everlasting life. Here's the point. God didn't send his son into the world to judge it. Instead, he is here to rescue a world headed towards certain destruction. Why does God allow for judgment and condemnation? Because the light sent from God pierced through the world's darkness to expose ill motives, hatred, gossip, greed, violence, and the like. Still, some people preferred the darkness over the light because their actions were dark. Indeed, who would ever believe it? Who would possibly accept what we've been told? Who has witnessed the awesome power and plan of the eternal in action? Out of emptiness he came, like a tender shoot from rock-hard ground. He didn't look like anything or any one of consequence. He had no physical beauty to attract our attention. So he was despised and forsaken by men, this man of suffering, grief's patient friend. As if he was a person to avoid, we looked the other way. He was despised, forsaken, and we took no notice of him. Yet it was our suffering he carried, our pain and distress, our sick to the soulness. We just figured that God had rejected him, that God was the reason he hurt so badly. But he was hurt because of us. He suffered so. Our wrongdoing wounded and crushed him. He endured the breaking that made us whole. The injuries he suffered became our healing. We all have wandered off like shepherdless sheep, scattered by our aimless striving and endless pursuits. The Eternal One laid on him, this silent sufferer, the sins of us all. Before the Passover festival began, Jesus was keenly aware that his hour had come to depart from this world and to return to the Father. From beginning to end, Jesus' days were marked by his love for his people. Before Jesus and his disciples gathered for dinner, the adversary filled Judas Iscariot's heart with plans of deceit and betrayal. When the meal was prepared, Jesus sat at the table joined by his disciples. He said, it has been my desire to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. Know this, I will not eat another Passover meal until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. 
Then he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and shared it with them. He said, this is my body, my body given for you. Do this to remember me. And similarly, after the meal had been eaten, he took the cup, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant made in my blood. Know this, I will not drink another sip of wine until the kingdom of God has arrived in fullness. Jesus was becoming visibly distressed and said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. The disciples began to stare at one another, wondering who was the unfaithful disciple. One disciple in particular, who was loved by Jesus, reclined next to him at the table. Peter motioned to the disciple at Jesus' side, find out who the betrayer is. So the beloved disciple, leaning into Jesus, said, Lord, who, who is it? Jesus replied, I will dip a piece of bread in my cup and give it to Judas, the one who will betray me. He dipped in one piece in the cup and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After this occurred, Satan entered into Judas. Jesus said to Judas, make haste and do what you are going to do. No one understood Jesus' instructions to Judas. Because Judas carried the money, some thought he was being instructed to buy the necessary items for the feast or give some money to the poor. So Judas took his piece of bread and departed into the night. After Jesus spoke at some length more with the disciples, he said, I am almost finished speaking to you, 
The one who rules the world is stepping forward, and he has no part in me. But to demonstrate to the cosmos my love for the Father, I will do just as he commands. Stand up. It is time for us to leave this place. Jesus, lifting his face to the heavens, began to pray, Father, my time has come. Glorify your Son, and I will bring you great glory because you have given me total authority over humanity. I have come bearing the plentiful gifts of God, and all who receive me will experience everlasting life, a new intimate relationship with you, the one true God, and Jesus the Anointed, the one you have sent. When Jesus finished praying, he began a brief journey with his disciples to the other side of the Kidron Valley, a deep ravine that floods in the winter rains, then farther on to a garden where he gathered his disciples. Judas Iscariot, who had already set his betrayal in motion and knew that Jesus often met with the disciples in this olive grove, entered the garden with an entourage of Roman soldiers and officials sent by the chief priests and Pharisees. They brandished their weapons under the light of torches and lamps. Jesus stepped forward. It was clear that he was not surprised because he knew all things. Jesus said, whom are you looking for? Judas's entourage answered, Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus said, I am the one. Judas, the betrayer, stood with the military force. As Jesus spoke, I am the one, the forces fell back on the ground. Jesus asked them a second time, Whom are you searching for? Judas's entourage said again, Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus replied, I have already said that I am the one. If you are looking for me, then let these men go free. This happened to fulfill the promise he made that none of those entrusted to him would be lost. Suddenly, Peter lunged toward Malchus, one of the high priest's servants, and with his sword, Peter severed the man's right ear. Jesus said to Peter, put down your sword and return it to the sheath. Am I to turn away from the cup the Father has given me to drink? So the Roman commanders, soldiers, and Jewish officials arrested Jesus, cuffing his hands and feet. Before the sun had risen, Jesus was taken to the governor's palace. The Jewish leaders would not enter the palace because their presence in a Roman office would defile them and cause them to miss the Passover feast. Pilate, the governor, met them outside. Pilate asked, what charges do you bring against this man? The priests and officials replied, if he weren't a lawbreaker, we wouldn't have brought him to you. Then judge him yourselves, Pilate replied, by your own law. They answered, our authority does not allow us to give him the death penalty. All these things were a fulfillment of the words Jesus had spoken, indicating the way that he would die. So Pilate re-entered the governor's palace and called for Jesus to follow him. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you asking me because you believe that this is true, or have others said it about me? I'm not a Jew, am I? Your people, including the chief priests, have arrested you and placed you in my custody. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not recognized in this world. If this were my kingdom, my servants would be fighting for my freedom. But my kingdom is not in this physical realm. Pilate said, So you are a king? You say that I am a king, Jesus replied. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the cosmos to demonstrate the power of truth. Everyone who seeks truth hears my voice. Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? Pilate left Jesus to go and speak to the Jewish people. I have not found any cause for charges to be brought against this man. Your custom is that I should release a prisoner to you each year in honor of the Passover celebration. 
Shall I release the king of the Jews to you? They shouted, No, not this man. Give us Barabbas. You should know that Barabbas was a terrorist. Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted thorny branches together as a crown and placed it onto his brow and wrapped him in a purple cloth. They drew near to him, shouting, striking at Jesus. Bow down, everyone! This is the king of the Jews! Pilate went out to the crowd and said, Listen, I stand in front of you with this man to make myself clear. I find this man innocent of any crimes. Then Jesus was paraded out before the people, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate called out, Here is the man! The chief priests and officers shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate retorted, You take him and crucify him. I have declared him not guilty of any punishable crime. They said, If you release this man, you have betrayed Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king threatens Caesar's throne. After Pilate heard these accusations, he sent Jesus out and took his seat in the place where he rendered judgment. This place was called the pavement, or Gabbatha in Hebrew. All this occurred at the sixth hour on the day everyone prepares for the Passover. Pilate said to the Jews, Look, here is your king. They shouted, Put him away! Crucify him! Pilate asked, You want me to crucify your king? The chief priests responded, We have no king but Caesar! The anguish that Jesus has begun to endure and that will only intensify consists of both physical and spiritual suffering. The one who has said that he is the life of the world is about to experience death. Physically, his body will endure the most brutal of executions ever devised. Spiritually, he was said to have eternally existed at God's side, but he will experience separation from God. Other Gospels record that Jesus cried out from the cross the question, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is a question asked by Jesus' ancestor, King David, in Psalm 22. That whole psalm is echoed in the events that are about to befall Jesus. Hear now David's prayer of anguish that Jesus relives. My God, my God, why have you deserted me? Why are you so far away? Won't you listen to my groans and come to my rescue? I cry out day and night, but you don't answer and I can never rest. Yet you are the holy God, ruling from your throne and praised by Israel. Our ancestors trusted you and you rescued them. When they cried out for help, you saved them and you did not let them down when they depended on you. But I am merely a worm far less than human, and I am hated and rejected by people everywhere. Everyone who sees me makes fun and sneers. They shake their heads and say, Trust the Lord. If you're his favorite, let him protect you and keep you safe. You, Lord, brought me safely through birth, and you protected me when I was a baby at my mother's breast. From the day I was born, I have been in your care, and from the time of my birth, you have been my God. Don't stray far off when I am in trouble with no one to help me. Enemies are all around like a herd of wild bulls. Powerful bulls from Bashan are everywhere. My enemies are like lions roaring and attacking with jaws open wide. I have no more strength than a few drops of water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like melted wax. My strength has dried up like a broken clay pot, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You, God, have left me to die in the dirt. Brutal enemies attack me like a pack of dogs, tearing at my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones, and my enemies just stare and sneer at me. They took my clothes and gambled for them.
Pilate handed him over to his soldiers, knowing that he would be crucified. They sent Jesus out carrying his own instrument of execution, the cross, to a hill known as the Place of the Skull, Golgotha in Hebrew. In that place, they crucified him along with two others. One was on his right and the other on his left. Pilate ordered that a plaque be placed above Jesus' head. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Because the site was near an urban region, it was written in three languages, Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, so that all could understand. The chief priests said to Pilate, don't write the King of the Jews, write, he said I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, I have written what I have written. As Jesus was being crucified, the soldiers tore his outer garments into four pieces, one for each of them. They wanted to do the same with his tunic, but it was seamless, one piece of fabric woven from the top down. So they said, don't tear it, let's cast lots, and the winner will take the whole thing. This happened in keeping with the Hebrew scriptures, which said, they divided my outer garments and cast lots for my clothes. These soldiers did exactly what was foretold in the Hebrew scriptures. Jesus' mother was standing next to his cross along with her sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Jesus looked to see his mother and the disciple he loved standing nearby. Jesus said to Mary, his mother, Dear woman, this is your son, motioning to the beloved disciple. To John, his disciple, he said, this is now your mother. From that moment, the disciple treated her like his own mother and welcomed her into his house. Jesus knew now that his work had been accomplished and the Hebrew scriptures were being fulfilled. And he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine had been left there, so they took a hyssop branch with a sponge soaked in the vinegar and put it to his mouth. When Jesus drank, he spoke, It is finished! In that moment, his head fell, and he gave up the spirit. The Jews asked Pilate to have their legs broken so the bodies would not remain on the crosses on the Sabbath. It was the day of preparation for the Passover, and that year the Passover fell on the Sabbath. The soldiers came and broke the legs of both the men crucified next to Jesus. When they came up to Jesus' cross, they could see that he was dead, so they did not break his legs. Instead, one soldier took his spear and pierced his abdomen, which brought a gush of blood and water. This testimony is true. In fact, it is an eyewitness account, and the witness has reported what he saw so that you also may believe. It happened this way to fulfill the Hebrew scriptures that said, not one of his bones shall be broken. And they also say, they will look upon him whom they pierced. After all of this, Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple who kept his faith secret for fear of the Jewish officials, made a request to Pilate for the body of Jesus. Pilate granted his request and Joseph retrieved the body. Nicodemus, who first came to Jesus under the cloak of darkness, brought over a hundred pounds of myrrh and ointments for his burial. Together they took Jesus' body and wrapped him in linen soaked in essential oils and spices according to Jewish burial customs. Near the place he was crucified, there was a garden with a newly prepared tomb. Because it was the day of preparation, they arranged to lay Jesus in this tomb so they could rest on the Sabbath.